Welcome to the De Nicola Center Winter Conference. We belong to each other. Our panel this afternoon is entitled Visit the Sick, What We Owe in Healthcare. We have a distinguished panel of, of well-experienced physicians who will offer some opening comments followed by conversation and then questions from the audience. And I want to alert the participants and the audience that they can click at any time on the Q&A icon at the bottom of their Zoom screen and submit a question to the moderator. We will collect your questions and pose them to the panelists at the end of the session. So our panelists and our first speaker will be Kristen Collier, is a assistant professor of internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School, where she also serves as director of the medical school program on health, spirituality, and religion. Our second speaker will be Dr. Laris Kaljian, director of the program in bioethics and humanities at the University of Iowa Carver Center of Medicine, where he's also a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and holds the Richard M. Kaplan Chair in Biomedical Ethics and Medical Humanities. He received his MD degree from the University of Michigan and an MDiv and PhD in ethics, Christian ethics that is, from Yale University. And he completed his residency and fellowship training at Yale University in internal medicine and infectious disease. Dr. Aaron Cariotti is director of the medical ethics program at UC Irvine Health. He serves as chairman of the Medical Ethics Committee at UC Irvine Hospital and is at, and at the California Department of, of State Hospitals. He graduated from the University of Notre Dame in philosophy and earned his MD from Georgetown, completed residency training at UC Irvine. He has uh, most recently been serving on COVID-related issues such as ventilator triage and vaccine allocation for various offices in the, his university and in the state. So welcome our panelists, and uh, we really look forward to this very important subject and your insights from your experience. So Kristen, please go ahead. Thanks, William, and thank you for the Danilka Center for inviting me to speak with you all today. So just want to start with a few opening remarks before we get to my co-panelists and our discussion today, if you don't mind. Today, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. That man, that woman, that child is my brother or my sister. In preparation for this panel, I've been meditating on these words by Mother Teresa. The word that has stood out most to me is the word forgotten. So I've been thinking, if we've forgotten that we belong to each other, as I agree that we have, this must mean that at some point we knew this to be true. I can almost hear this as a rebuke given by Moses, Isaiah, or one of the prophets of the Hebrews. Have you forgotten what has been told to you, that you belong to one another? The other word that stands out, of course, is the word belong. What does it mean to belong to one another? What does this look like in medicine? Hopefully we'll be able to collectively dive into this topic today. And I hope that my following open remarks will serve as a springboard for further discussion, hope to challenge us deeply and engender really a lot of questions, probably more than answers today. So let's start off with what I believe we've forgotten in medicine. What do we need to remember? First of all, we have forgotten that we are created in relation, not only to God, but to one another. Relationship is at the heart of the redemptive historical narrative of the scriptures. In them, we are told of a creator God who makes himself known to his people, who loves and cares for his children through intimate relationship and who is physically present with them. God himself, the maker of all things, enters into a relationship with mankind through a covenant in a way that is physical, intimate, and eventually incarnate. The Genesis account paints a picture of the maker of heaven and earth, walking in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve and speaking to them by name. We read of the great physician Jesus in the gospel accounts, taking a man by the hand and leading him out of town. I always wonder when I read that passage, what did they talk about? 
Because God is the creator of all things, we should not be surprised that because his creation is relational, that all we do is meant to be done in relation if we are expected to flourish. And medicine is no exception. Relationship should be at the heart of what we do in medicine. And relationship building should be prioritized if we are to flourish in our vocational work. Not only has the patient-physician relationship be shown to improve patient outcomes, making it a patient safety issue, but meaningful relationships with patients can also help prevent burnout in physicians. Secondly, we have forgotten in healthcare that each patient we take care of is made in the image and likeness of God. And each person is inherently valuable because they are the Imago Dei. If Mother Teresa says that man, that woman, that child is my brother or my sister, note she did not say that we are to treat each person like a brother or a sister, but that they are a brother or a sister. Because of course, belonging to each other is different than just a sense of belonging, like one of just fitting in. If we are truly to belong to one another, there is a claim upon each other that is so much more than just a sense of accepting or of fitting in. That out of belonging, we can start to see our patients as gift because we love them. The claims made upon us by our patients, especially those who have more needs, can challenge us and even risk causing us moral distress because often we are inadequately trained to manage them and live in a society in which we often cannot get our patients all they need to truly flourish. So how are we to respond to this? And what causes us to forget, especially as it relates to medicine? The cause, in my opinion, lies somewhere in medical education. Medical education is a tough road. It is my opinion that most people enter the vocation with a good heart and pure motivation. People want to go into medicine to help people at a time of the greatest need. When I'm asked by people discerning the vocation of medicine, I ask them one question. Are you a lover of humanity? Not of receptors, not of diseases, not of symptoms, but people. People and all their brokenness and messiness and with the ugliness that is sin, disease, and death. And for those who say yes, it is clear to them when they start training and then something happens and they, we lose our way. We forget why we went into medicine in the first place. And by the end of medical training, we see life merely as molecules in motion. It reminds me of the passage in The Silver Chair, the fourth book of C.S. Lewis's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, when Aslan tells Jill before she goes on her quest that there are signs she thinks are clear now. But once she starts, the signs she will need to look for will not always be as obvious as they may seem. And Aslan gives her the following counsel, quote, here I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind." End quote. It's like he is warning her that she too will forget. Many start off with clear thoughts about what the telos or the end of medicine is, to take care of persons, be attentive to their suffering, always keeping in mind their inherent dignity and an essence to love them. But in the process of medical education and training, we lose our way. In essence, we have forgotten to love our patients. This is the third thing we have forgotten. That's what it really comes down to. We have forgotten to love our patients. So what does it mean to belong to one another? For us to think about this, we need to first reflect upon what our responsibility or obligations are to our patients and to society. Our panel is called What We Owe Society, What We Owe Them. From a very pedestrian standpoint, physicians have obligations to society that are outlined by our professional societies and in part are due to the fact that society, as you may know, pays for graduate medical education. Our trainees are paid by CMMS and therefore we have an obligation to take care of society. We have a code of ethics that lays out some basic obligations that we cannot abandon our patients, for example, that we must act by reasonable standards according to our skills to diagnose, treat and refer. Regarding the pandemic, we look to our professional ethics to guide our duties. The ethics manual of the American College of Physicians, for example, states that the ethical imperative for physicians to provide care, quote, overrides the risk to the treating physician, even during epidemics, unquote. The AMA asserts that, quote, individual physicians have an obligation to provide urgent medical care during disasters, end quote, emphasizing that this duty persists, quote, even in the face of greater than usual risks to physicians' own safety, health, or life, end quote. So yes, we have obligations that are set forth by various societies and groups, but is this all there is? Or is this an impoverished vision of what a relationship to our patients could look like? Is there more? Do we need to reimagine or remember 
what true belonging to each other looks like? And can we move beyond a sense of legalistic binding obligation to instead one of freeing aspirations? Can we think about the signs like in Jill's quest in Narnia of what we have to guide us in these aspirations? Can we look to wisdom like McIntyre's virtues of acknowledged dependence that include practices of just generosity, hospitality, and misericordia? We work in hospitals, remember. What does it mean to reimagine hospitality in hospitals? And can we look to Jesus' example as the great physician and his way of seeing beyond the purely biological needs of the people he encountered, his deep concern for those on the margins, and his deep sorrow for what has been lost? Do these guideposts challenge our ideas of professionalism and the often detached professionalism that is often taught in the hidden curriculum of medical education? Can these first principles, or as I refer to it, our theology of medicine, not only guide our patient care, but also our work in medical education, research, and advocacy? Do we have record numbers of physician burnout because we have forgotten so much? So as we think about threats to us being the types of doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals we want to be, and really should be, because there are so many and we are falling so short, I think it is helpful to spend some time reflecting upon the current status of many physician-patient relationships and the drift that has occurred towards a contract model, one that is increasingly being framed in a transactional manner, one that forgets the binding of us to each other, but instead marginalizes the physician and centers the patient in the center of the encounter as a solo automaton in a transactional exchange with a faceless, interchangeable provider. Even the language that we use, patient-centered care, reflects this, which is why I prefer the term relationship-centered care. Can we reimagine the relationship as a covenant of sorts where both people enter into a relationship of mutuality and commitment that provides a fuller view of the potential of this relationship and having the humility to remember again that this relationship is reciprocal and that for every physician in their life at some point will also become a patient. Again, we are reminded that Jesus was both the suffering servant and the great physician, but for him in the great mystery, this was at the same time. This also reminds me of what St. Joseph Maria wrote in The Way. And I quote, <clears throat> quote, children, the sick, and she used capital letters for the words children and sick. She continued, as you write these words, don't you feel tempted to use capitals? The reason is that in children and in the sick, a soul in love sees him, end quote, with him, obviously with a capital H. A soul in love. Can we let ourselves be transformed by love for our patients? As I close, I'm reminded of the prayer of Maimonides, quote, in thine eternal providence, thou hast chosen me to watch over the life and health of thy creatures. I am now about to apply myself to the duties of my profession. Support me, almighty God, in these great labors that they may benefit mankind for without thy help, not even the least thing will succeed. So I'd like to take Mother Teresa's phrase and reword it to our aspiration. Today, if we have peace, it is because we have remembered that we belong to each other. That man, that woman, that child is my brother or my sister. As we go forward with our discussion today, I hope we can think about what it means to remind ourselves to our patients in love, while at the same time remembering that all this work is the gift of God. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for those very thoughtful and stirring words. Loris, you're on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, whoever are out there now and later on, and our great privilege to, to get to collaborate with Bill and with uh, Kristen and Aaron. And thanks to the, the Nicola Center for all that they do to support such a remarkable enterprise at Notre Dame that has such a reach around uh, the country and the world. So I'd like to just begin by making some opening remarks of my, remarks of my own that are contextualized by the current pandemic, for sure, um, and are focusing really on, on two areas. One is this notion of the duty to care especially when the duty to care in healthcare comes at a risk to one's own self because of the nature of contagious disease. But then also on the question of justice and justice in the administration or distribution of healthcare. Um, one thing I won't be talking about but matters greatly in, in this whole <clears throat> landscape is also the notions of solidarity. Uh, to be in solidarity, not only with healthcare professionals who put themselves in harm's way, in order to care for those who are in need, 
uh, but also for all the people outside of health care uh, who provide essential services that have been so uh, ready and forthcoming uh, to put their own lives at risk for the sake <clears throat> of all the things that we either do take for granted or have learned not to take for granted uh, during these difficult times. <clears throat> so first, this the duty of the care. And I think of this duty as being <clears throat> closely related to this notion of belonging to each other, right? Because when we think about what it is for health professionals, and I will speak as a physician, to have this duty, we're, we're mindful um, that, that we enter into a profession voluntarily and we literally profess, that's why we're called professionals, right? We profess uh, to be certain kinds of people when we say that we are healers. And I, I wanna say, before I just say a bit more about duty to care, that a disclaimer is that I have not myself been on the front lines as a clinician during this pandemic. But having been trained in infectious disease and grown up in the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, I certainly was uh, caring for many, many AIDS patients over the years. And one of the residents in my uh, residency program uh, seroconverted to HIV positive. So it was a real phenomenon for many of us in that generation uh, of healthcare. So what is this basis for the clinician's duty to care? And it was, I thought about this, I thought about three things that at least physicians and I presume other health professionals would avow. And that is, we make a promise, right? That's the idea of we profess something. We respond to the patient's need. And I'll come back to that when talking about justice. And then we have a certain ability, right? And even this word responsibility, responsibility, the ability to respond. I think when we combine promise, the patient's need and our ability uh, to respond, we get our duty. These days, however, I do not take it for granted that everyone's on the same page in the health professions regarding what all this means. So what exactly have we promised? How do we define a patient's need? And what are the limits of our overall ability to respond to those needs? So I think these are open questions. And a place like Notre Dame, the Nicholas Center, and the, the, the Christian Witness that speaks to profound understandings that Kristen has already referred to in terms of the Imago Dei, in terms of the real basis for a claim that we owe something to our neighbor because of how we have a shared relationship to our creator, right? But that's a profound story that we tell and we believe as the true story that explains who we are and what we do as Christians in healthcare, realizing that by God's grace, many people outside of the Christian faith also avow deep commitments to their, their neighbor, even if they don't describe it in those terms. But still, the question of extent is always there. That this duty is very ancient, of course. Those who read the history of, of healthcare and the history of Christian healthcare will go back to the early centuries uh, of the church as well as uh, to, the, to the Reformation. And I was struck myself when reading uh, during the last year about Martin Luther and his response uh, that he wrote in a letter because pastors were, were wondering what were their obligations to sit tight and stay in a town when the plague had hit. And, and he said in an English translation, we die at our post. He wrote, Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. Profound, these, these witnesses, and of course, many of you can cite many other examples. One example I use in my teaching uh, for students is I make re reference to Dr. Carlo Urbani. Some of you may recognize his name. Uh, he was well known uh, with, within Doctors Without Borders, and he uh, accepted the Nobel Priest Prize on their behalf in 1999. But he died in 2003, and to my knowledge, he was the first health professional to die from SARS-1, right? And one of the things he said in his accepted speech in 1999 was, health and dignity cannot be dissociated in human beings. It is our duty to stay close to victims and guarantee their rights. So that staying close is part of this duty to care, and it's basic to the health professionals. And we should encourage each other, encourage our children, encourage anyone who's interested in healthcare to take profoundly seriously what the implications of this are. And given what Christian just said about contract versus covenant, let's say, we, we should not take for granted uh, that there needs to be a profoundly deep commitment that is deeply anchored 
in, in a true moral vision uh, that, that has staying power, especially when pandemic or plague hit. I, I want to talk just briefly about justice, and, and, I, and I wish I had more time in one sense, but perhaps the conversation will lead in these directions. And I say this because justice, if you read, for instance, Joseph Pieper, the great interpreter of Aristotle and Aquinas, uh, he describes uh, Thomas as referring to three basic forms of justice. What individuals owe each other as individuals, what individuals owe their communities or government, and what communities or government owe individuals. We tend to think right now during a pandemic so much in terms of what governments owe individuals, distributive justice. But I'm particularly interested in where physicians and other health professionals situate themselves when trying to understand what do they owe a very special group of human beings, their patients. And one of the big tensions that I perceive in the medical ethical landscape is the tension between the individual patient and the so-called population. And even there's a phrase called population health that wants clinicians to think in a hybrid merged way that combines patient care and public health into one called population health. I believe that's an unstable construct because at a certain level, one cannot have fiduciary responsibilities to two entities that are actually in somewhat of a competition. And I think a pandemic brings that to the fore. So another person I've benefited from over the years who's written about justice in healthcare is Gene Outka, who was one of my mentors at Yale. And he talks about how you can think about justice in different ways. And he, after ruling out certain ways that are not appropriate in healthcare, he lands on two which I think all of us will resonate with. Giving to each according to their need and similar treatment for similar cases. I think those are two key drivers for how we need to think about how we respond to patients at all times and especially during a pandemic. The challenge in the distribution of, of resources in healthcare, of course, that the challenges are many, uh, but one of the deep tensions is what you could describe in ethics language terms as being the tension between beneficence versus utility. And what utility does as part of utilitarian reasoning is it wants to maximize beneficence within a group or across a population. And that's where things start, start to change. As, as William Franken uh, you know, has, has pointed out in, in his writing over the years in ethics, is that beneficence implies an obligation to do good and avoid harm, but utility compromises that ideal by allowing for harm within an overall balance that maximizes the sum total of good over evil. And that's a very important contrast because I think right now, when you think, when you hear about so-called crisis standards of care, and if you're not familiar with that phrase, I'd encourage you to Google it, uh, search for it and learn about it because there are in states and, and in hospitals, there are policies now that describe crisis standards of care that basically allow for there to be a shift in the usual way that we care for patients. So the distinguishing feature of those standards is a shift from a traditional healthcare focus on benefits to patients one at a time to a focus on patients to populations. And that's catalyzed by a utilitarian appeal to maximization. And so what you get in certain you know, published accounts of the kinds of triage or allocation schemes that are being recommended is a focus on lives saved, life years gained, instrumental value to society, and younger age. And I think this will be part of what I'm sure we'll, we'll be talking about. And I'll, I'll close in just a few moments here. Um, by, but I'll first just say that whenever we look at those kind of criteria, we, we need to ask ourselves, how does that or does it not harmonize with the Imago Dei, a Christian understanding of true and fundamental equality for all human beings before the eyes of God, as it were, right? That's the question in, in my mind. And I don't take it for granted in our culture, as influenced as we have been by the Jewish and Christian traditions, that everyone actually shares the same understanding. And even in fact, Kristen, in one of her comments, she made reference to, to humanity, as being a key aspect. If you read Immanuel Kant, Kristen wasn't using the word this way, but Kant, his use of the word humanity, 
as being an end in itself actually refers to human reason. And when rational capacity is lost, some people believe the person is also lost. I, as a Christian, don't believe that, right? So these are kinds of examples where in our society, there are different ways of looking at these things. And in a pandemic, when people start to feel the crunch of resources, you start to, in a sense, see that pressure applied on how people actually view what matters most to them. So I'll, I'll end there and look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for the, especially for the uh, latter point, which I'm sure we'll want to return to. It strikes me as very important in understanding how the physician's role may differ from the sociologist or social planner. Aaron, you're on. Thanks, Bill. Um, thanks, Lars and Kristen, for your opening remarks, which I'm not going to attempt to add to by focusing on philosophy of medicine or on our obligations. I, I think what's already been said in that regard has been terrific. Um, it's great for me to be back at my alma mater, at least virtually uh, today. And I remember when David Solomon started this, this outfit. I think I went to the first or the second of these conferences as an undergraduate. So I have very fond memories of my early intellectual formation in, in precisely this setting. So uh, I wanna thank Carter and the rest of the folks at the, the Nicola Center. And just, actually, I'll take this chance to put in a plug for Carter's new book. So any of you in the audience that are interested in medical ethics uh, should take a look at what it means to be human, um, which uh, I just finished a couple of weeks ago. And it's, uh, it's a very important contribution to public bioethics, in my opinion. Uh, so Carter, you can, uh, you can tag me later for, for, for that, for that plug. Um, the thing that strikes me, and I, I do, I, I do want to have time to talk about the issues that Loris mentioned in relation to crisis standards of care. Uh, full disclosure, I was involved in drafting the University of California's crisis standards of care. So we had a we had a work group that the Office of the President put together for all six of the UC hospitals to hammer out our ventilator triage guidelines, basically. So I spent a couple of months knee deep in those in those questions of when and what it might look like to make that that shift from traditional bedside ethics to a population based ethics. And there's some very, very hard problems associated with um, with that and ones that actually here in my home state of California, uh, we may be facing soon uh, down here in Southern California, Los Angeles, especially things are things are getting pretty bad and we've moved into the contingency stage, which is the stage where you get really creative with your resources before you reach the crisis stage, which is the stage at which the demand overwhelms the supply of a critical resource, which might be a ventilator, it might be an ECMO machine, it might be a medication that could be of benefit to patients. Um, it may be personnel, too many doctors and nurses getting sick at the same time, uh, or being spread too thin because they're taking care of too many critically ill patients. Um, but actually, uh, I'm gonna spend my minute or two talking a little bit about um, two friends of mine. Uh, the first is a young man, his name was Matt, and today is the anniversary of his death. Matt was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was, uh, when I was in medical school and watching him deal with his mental illness was a big reason, I think, personally, that I ended up going into psychiatry. And when I was an intern, um, sad to say, Matt ended up dying by suicide. He, he took his own life, uh, which also had a profound impact on me. And just a few weeks ago, I, I lost another friend to suicide, a young man, 17 years old, who I've known since he was an infant. Um, his parents are dear friends of mine and my and my wife. We've known them for many years, and our kids grew up together. Um, so my 16-year-old son was uh, was really close to to William, and I think William and Matt were suffering from for a lot of reasons. They were suffering, in one case, from the illness of manic depression, bipolar disorder, and from the other, in the other case, uh, from from unipolar depression. 
for which there were underlying biological causes. Um, but in as with any mental illness and many, many straightforward medical illnesses as well, we're learning more and more about the social and even cultural determinants of health. And their deaths, um, and particularly Williams most recently during the pandemic was another reminder to me that, um, that really all of us, I think the entire society right now is suffering during the pandemic, whether or not you've had COVID or you're even concerned about getting COVID, whether you've been vaccinated or not yet. Uh, this is a rather unusual time in healthcare in that in a sense, um, this may be somewhat overstated, but I don't think it's, it's too overstated to say that everyone in our society is currently um, in a broad sense, a patient is currently su su suffering in some way because of the pandemic or because of our collective decisions in response to the pandemic in terms of locking down and socially distancing and um, conditioning one another to, um, uh, to, see, to see the other as a potential source of danger. I got, a, I got a text message just the other day from Kaiser Permanente, my own health insurer, uh, advising me to enjoy the holidays alone. And my favorite phrase in there was, uh, this was the new hashtag uh, tagline was, don't share your air which struck me as a really sort of bizarre proposal. Um, I, I wouldn't know how not to share my air. Uh, I don't think my air belongs to me. Um, and yet, you know, we've, we've reached a state now in which not only um, other people, but sort of the, the shared resources, the air and the water uh, and other aspects of the common good between us, uh, we somehow need to, need to, see as our own and 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 isolate um, isolate ourselves and our use of these resources one from another. And as Christian pointed out, we're not built to live like this. And all of this is having an effect on us, I would suggest. Um, that's not to criticize our public policies, though I have my own opinions on uh, the decisions that we've made in, in the face of the pandemic, which we can chat about later, but it's just to acknowledge um, just uh, how widespread the current suffering is during the pandemic. And I'll mention just a few stats in a moment to maybe drive that home. And, um, and then to propose the idea that the, the title of this, um, of this session, you know, visit the sick, what we owe in healthcare should not just be applicable or of interest to those in the audience who are healthcare professionals, like the panelists here or like our moderator, but, but to all of us precisely because uh, so many people right now are suffering in ways uh, that may require professional intervention from healthcare providers, uh, from physicians or mental health professionals or whatever, but, um, but also suffering in ways that, that can be helped by everyone, by ordinary citizens, by family, by friends, by next door neighbors. Uh, and so I hope we can think through the, the questions that we're going to ask in this panel as it relates not just to those of us in healthcare or health policy or public health, uh, but to all of us as, as citizens who have obligations and solidarity to one another. I'm not going to throw a bunch of statistics at you, but I just want to mention before I wrap up my intro. Um, a report that was published a few months ago by the CDC got very little attention uh, because everyone's, everyone's attention seems uh, to be more focused on COVID case curves, which are, are of course important. But this was a um, pretty well done population based survey that was conducted back in June, about 5,000 randomly sampled Americans looking at mental health consequences of of the lockdowns. Four in 10 people in this survey reported at least one mental or behavioral health condition. About a third of them significant symptoms of uh, 
anxiety and depression, about a quarter of respondents had significant symptoms of a trauma or stressor related disorder uh, that was connected to the pandemic. That would be something like PTSD or acute, what psychiatrists call acute stress disorder. About 13% reported having increased their use of substances or their use of alcohol to deal with negative emotions uh, from COVID or from the lockdowns. And then, uh, and this circles back to, um, to the anniversary of my friend's death and, and the recent death of, of another friend of mine by suicide, one in 10 Americans in June had seriously contemplated taking their own life in the last 30 days, not, not in their entire lifespan, but at some point that month. And most alarming to me was the, uh, was the finding that one in four, 25%, a quarter of young adults age 18 to 24 had considered suicide, seriously considered suicide in the last month. So we don't, we don't yet have numbers from the CDC on completed suicides for 2020. That'll take another year, year and a half to get those numbers. But the, the early indications um, suggest to me that a, a lot of Americans are uh, suffering not just depression and anxiety, which have, which have tripled and quadrupled compared to 2019, respectively, but, um, but that they're suffering to such an extent that they feel that they can't go on anymore, that they feel that they've, they've given up hope. And certainly there's a need for mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, and so forth to intervene and help these folks with, uh, with their depression or their anxiety or their drug and alcohol use problem that may be contributing to suicidality. But I think there's a role for all of us um, to connect with one another, to recognize the, the epidemic of social isolation and loneliness that is impacting people, not just in these ways. I mean, we can look at the statistics for uh, general medical conditions, not just mental health conditions, and see the ways in which social isolation is adversely impacting those things as well. Um, so it, that's, that's what's been on my mind recently. Um, the, just, um, just thinking through how widespread the impacts of this pandemic have become, the fact that all of us to one de degree or another are, are suffering in ways that could be, um, you know, could highlight the fact that, that each of us, uh, as McIntyre puts it, are dependent rational an animals. We're, we're, we're on some, some scale of, of disability or we're suffering in some way uh, that we require uh, the help of others, uh, whether that's professionalized help or uh, the, the ordinary help from families and communities. So let's, let's think through the questions for the rest of this session in terms of uh, all of us, being, in a sense, being healthcare providers during this time. Uh, trying to do our part in the pandemic, and all of us uh, being patients who need to be open to the help uh, that others others are offering during this time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, especially for broadening our relational perspectives on this and reminding us that health as wholeness is not just a physical matter, but also a social and spiritual one. So wonderful comments from all three of you. I'd like to open the discussion session by letting each of you respond to one another or add on where you where you have something further to say at this time. So take it away. I think I would like to start if you don't mind. I, I'm really interested in sort of maybe broadening our conversation out around um, the crisis standards of care. Um, and Aaron, I know that you live and work in California, and many of us were alarmed on social media and Twitter and the news when we heard this past week or the week before that, that patients were no longer being uh, transported, for example, um, to hospitals um, who had out-of-hospital cardiac arrest were at risk or return of spontaneous circulation wasn't achieved. Um, you know, I, I would say that, that that seems like a crisis standard of care. Uh, would you agree? And, and it's just living in California, and it sounds like you've been working on some of these policies. Like, what are, you, what are your thoughts about that, being living on the West Coast right now as a medical doctor? Uh, yeah, it's a great question, uh, Kristen. I do agree that that directive, which went out 
to basically all the EMTs in, uh, e it was either the city of Los Angeles or the county of Los Angeles. I, I can't recall, but it was, it was LA um, that there was now a certain category of patients that ordinarily would have been brought to the hospital. Uh, these are patients that have a, have a cardiac arrest, uh, that code in the field, and the EMTs are not able to reestablish uh, a heartbeat. Um, I mean, the first thing to be said, and this doesn't minimize the fact that, um, that this is a rather striking and alarming development, um, most of these are, are folks that are not going to survive, uh, even if they're brought to an, an emergency department. Uh, there's going to be uh, you know, a physician that will take a look at them and um, pronounce them dead or maybe continue CPR efforts for a bit longer. But after a certain period of time, we know that if patients have been getting CPR, in the field and they, you're not able to reestablish uh, breathing and, and circulation um, or at least intubate them and reestablish circulation, that the outcomes are going to be very, very poor. With that said, um, I would agree that, that this, would, this would be an example, probably the first example that we've seen of crossing that threshold from how do we utilize resources creatively. That would be things like, um, uh, sourcing more ventilators or using portable ventilators that wouldn't be the first device we would reach for in an ICU, but kind of redeploying them to be used in an ICU or turning an, an operating room ordinarily used for elective surgeries into an ICU bed and using the ventilator in the OR for, uh, for a critically ill patient. Uh, we Once we get to the point where we say, okay, now there's now a category of patients that under ordinary circumstances would have been brought to the hospital and received some level of evaluation uh, and intervention. Those folks are not going to be brought to the hospital. Then, yes, I think we've crossed that sort of definitional boundary into crisis standards of care, and that is a, that is a move into the realm of triage. Uh, so it's a serious move, and it's one that the the county public health officer there felt that he or she had to make. Um, and I think we can argue about whether or not it was necessary or whether it should have been done earlier, whether it should have been delayed until later or not done at all. But in principle, uh, I think all of us have to recognize that there, there is a point where our resources have outstripped our, um, our demand, right? And I think our first obligation is to push on the supply chain to avoid getting into that circumstance wherever possible. And if we get into that circumstance, to make it clear to public health authorities and others who have the power to move pieces around the chessboard, that this for physicians, especially those at the bedside, is really a, an intolerable situation. And we need to be pushing on that supply chain to get us out of this crisis circumstance as quickly as possible. And this is where we have to get really creative. So I've been proposing at the state level, uh, sort of standing up a um, sort of critical care reserve core of physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapists that can be deployed to other parts of the state to help with the supply of personnel, uh, which in some places is probably the most critically ill, uh, critically um, uh, uh, short resource. And cutting through bureaucratic red tape in terms of getting hospital privileges and making sure those, those physicians are insured adequately at, their, uh, at the institutions where they may land and so forth. Um, I think if, if we had the infrastructure to do that and there was encouragement uh, to the various institutions to share their resources in that way, even may, maybe even make it a, a sort of publicly acknowledged competition, um, recognizing that there would be reciprocity if you know if you loan us some of your ICU docs and nurses for a week or two uh, if you find yourself a month or two down the road in the same circumstances we're gonna we're gonna repay in kind right that spirit of solidarity and generosity finding creative ways to en encourage that uh, and within the current healthcare system that is pretty siloed and in many respects sort of privatized that is I think that's a challenge but this crisis has pushed us to start doing a lot of things that we're not used to doing. And, um, and it's a 
We could see it purely as a crisis, or we could see it as an opportunity to think creatively about the healthcare system as, as a whole, uh, how we're using our our resources, and um, and how where our loyalty or where our loyalties lie. Right, is my primary loyalty as a physician to this particular institution that's paying my salary, or is it to or is it to patients? And if it's to patients, then uh, do I have some degree of obligation to try to go where there are the most patients in most need of what I'm capable of offering? Uh, so, I mean, there's more I could say, but I'll maybe let Laura's comment on this. Yeah, on this I'd, I'd, I'd like to, because it, it raises some profound questions, again, about this duty to care. Mm -hmm. and, and that duty can also be described in terms of our fiduciary responsibility to the patient right in front of me. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around what my obligation is to unknown other patients elsewhere. But likewise, you know, part of the story of the Good Samaritan has to do with what some would refer to as this notion of proximity. Mm -hmm. That the story was not about this Samaritan who was given some abstract theoretical sense of obligation for humanity. It was this wounded man on the road, right? Likewise, for the EMTs in LA, or for doctors in my hospital or any hospital in this world, if and when there's a patient right in front of them, I would want to argue, and I have tried to argue, <clears throat> that even if there is a triage committee or an allocation policy that says, here's the scoring system, and if your patient is above, your patient gets treated. If the patient's below that threshold, the patient doesn't get treatment X, let's say a ventilator. What I want to argue for is that every clinician should still maintain their moral professional integrity, and I would say conscientious practice in such a way that if they believe their patient still stands reasonably speaking, and each of us has to figure out what that word reasonable means there, still stands to benefit, that they should be prepared and allowed to appeal those decisions. Yeah. So if an EMT in, in LA under those circumstances, believes that this patient is different. And though all other patients who have arrested are 99.9% .9 likely to die, I believe I need to advocate for this patient. I would want to encourage that EMT based on being a professional with their fiduciary responsibility to do so. And the reason I can try to justify this in the end is to use what I call a notion of role fidelity, that it is the triage committee's responsibility to manage resources. It is the clinician's responsibility to care for patients one at a time. And then somehow you, of course, would ask, well, how does that all come together? Great question. But that's the process of dialogue and deliberation in real time, in real circumstances. And I think more justice is likely to be served if we allow there to be this sort of representation of different interests uh, than otherwise would be the case. Yeah, no, I I agree with you, Loris. I think distinguishing those roles is very important, and I'm happy to say that in the UC guidelines, and I consulted a bit um, polishing up the guidelines at the state level with the Department of Public Health here, that I think we did a pretty good job of, of trying to d clearly distinguish the role of the triage officers or the triage committee that's going to make that that judgment call about allocating a scarce resource and the bedside physician, right? Who within the constraints that that he's working within or that she's working within, within the systemic constraints, um, that physician is still able to give the patient everything that is available. And in fact, in, in the UC policy, we worked in a system such that the bedside physician could file an appeal with a triage committee as well, if they, if they think there was a mistake in the scoring system or a mistake in the assessment. Um, so devising these, these systems to work perfectly is not possible, but having some safeguards like that in place, I think is very important. I think it's also important that, um, that the triage committees have a community representative that is not employed by the institution, that's not working for the hospital, that has something of a watchdog role in terms of making sure that the policies are transparent and that they're that they're followed in a way that is fair and just 
And especially for patients that are what we call unrepresented, that don't have family or friends there to advocate for them or to file an appeal on, on their behalf, that we have additional safeguards in place for those patients under crisis standards of care. Because we know that the, the, patient, the folks that were vulnerable prior to the pandemic are the are the folks that are even more vulnerable now because of the pandemic. That's that's clear. Uh, and so all the more reason that we need to be paying even more attention to those who were who were vulnerable to begin with because of their social or economic or other circumstances. Kristen, you have anything to add in here? Oh, I do. So I I've been thinking a lot about this because it was like really the first example that I saw in the United States about what seemed like crisis standards of care coming into action with, with these patients not being transported. And so I was looking sort of at the data of, you know, what happens when people have out of hospital cardiac arrest and your ability to survive it, you know, as you probably know, is based on where you live. So I found in my own hometown of Detroit, um, your chances of surviving hospital discharge after an out of hospital cardiac arrest is 0.3%. If you live in Slovenia, it's 20%. So we had briefly commented earlier on the social determinants of health and such. I thought it was strikingly sad um, and tragic, and we could spend a whole hour talking about that in particular. But um, you know, when when we when you look at predictors, right, of who makes it from out of hospital cardiac arrest, there are like the four predictors, right? So if it's witnessed, do you have a shockable rhythm? Do you have bystander CPR, et cetera? Um, and do you get ROSC? So the, the the most powerful criterion associated with survival from odd possible cardiac arrest is ROS in the field, return of spontaneous circulation. So they chose that as the one to sort of say, if you don't have that, we're not going to transport you. But there was one study I found out of Dallas-Fort Worth um, that showed that 1.9% of the people actually who had odd possible cardiac arrest, who didn't have return of spontaneous circulation, they still made it to hospital discharge. 1.9% um, isn't nobody. Um, it's not the majority of folks, obviously, and in limited times, of course, those patients do, of course, take up um, time with personnel and such in the hospital. But um, I was actually talking about this with uh, Charlie Camosi, who's one of you know is a moral theologian. And I was like, wow, you know, 1.9% to hospital discharge, but hospital discharge isn't the full story, right? Doesn't talk about neurological outcomes of those patients, doesn't talk about how many patients are still alive at a year. And he was like, neurological outcomes, huh? He's like, let's talk about that because we always are having this discussion about how oftentimes there are a lot of ableist policies and ageist policies in medicine, yeah. you know? So he's like, are you saying maybe that the real issue here is that they don't want people with neurologic disability and disabled people, right? Because a lot of these patients end up with some degree of disability taking up beds in LA County and that's the thing, right? So it got me thinking about this policy in particular and what it says maybe about about our values. Um, and I do really like, Loris, the point that you mentioned about in, this, in the Good Samaritan, this is the patient in front of us. And sometimes you just have that feeling in your gut, right, as a doctor, that this patient, even though they don't fit the guidelines or they don't fit the policy, um, they don't fit the numbers. They just, they, they seem like they're gonna do okay. I need to trust my judgment. So I really liked your point there, but it was interesting to think about the, the intersection of disability actually, and this crisis standard of care in particular as it relates to LA County. Comments from Aaron or Loris on that? You know, it's interesting how we can talk about the sort of extreme cases of cardiac arrest, which I, I think, Chris, you've given a nice, very nice discussion of how that's not as extreme in one sense as it might even sometimes be portrayed to be. Um, but what, what I have a great concern is the, the so-called, it goes by the acronym SOFA, S-O-F-A, SOFA scores that are perhaps the most popular because they're believed to be the most credible uh, means of trying to predict outcomes. And I won't go into the details about whether it's short-term or, or long-term, but what I have in my mind is this more graduated, incremental, very utilitarian calculus type scheme that would say, well, if patient A has a 70% chance of surviving for seven years, but patient B has a 30% chance of surviving three years, patient A gets the one last remaining ventilator. Mm -hmm. And they are both, let's say, in respiratory failure needing mechanical ventilation. The question I think that I, I have for, for all of us is, is it not the case? Because I think it is among many people in healthcare and probably in society to say that, well, just intuitively, isn't it the case that if you can save more lives, you ought to do that? 
even if it requires discriminating between patient A and patient B, as I just described. But some of us would come back and say, you're not actually treating those two human beings as equal. And you're projecting into an unknown future in order to do so. And so I think that I've actually benefited recently from going back to Paul Ramsey's book from the 1970s, The Patient as Person, Chapter 7, where he basically argues, it's a very nuanced and lengthy, really important uh, discussion, but at a certain point, he argues for the goodness of randomization of either a natural lottery or an artificial lottery to make a choice that otherwise we can't in good conscience make if we really mean it when we say that all human beings are created equal by God. Loris, let me just comment on that because this was a long discussion and argument in our committee at the, at the University of California. Our guidelines are published, so I'm, I'm not saying anything that's, that's behind the scenes here, but one of the first guidelines that was published was the University of Pittsburgh guidelines. And they did take, uh, at least in their initial drafts, um, they may have changed this since then in response to the HHS Office of Civil Rights, I don't know. But at least when we were working on our guidelines, we were, we were looking to theirs as a potential model. And th there were some committee members, myself included, that were arguing against uh, certain aspects of that model. And just to break it down, it's precisely this uh, scenario that you're talking about. Uh, uh, of do, do we make our primary goal, the primary goal of these triage guidelines to save the most number of lives in the acute setting, or do we take the goal to save the most number of uh, so-called life years, um, which would prioritize younger people over older people? And without getting down into the weeds on all the philosophical arguments, I, I was of the strong opinion and advocated strongly that our endpoint be can this can the patient survive this hospitalization but that's the only thing that we look at trying to predict beyond that long-term survival how many life years they're likely to have less uh, is empirically very difficult and philosophically problematic for some of the reasons that paul ramsey describes in that in that chapter paul, uh, that chapter looks to uh, this this committee that was allocating uh in the early days of dialysis, allocating in Seattle a limited number of dialysis machines. I think it was back in the 1960s. Um, and this this group eventually got tagged with the label the God Committee. Um, but getting away from judgments about quality of life or social value and social utility uh, and seeing seeing each person as sort of one and only one, if you had to put it in numerical terms, uh, and focusing on short-term outcomes, which we can reasonably predict, at least we're better at predicting those than we are at predicting long-term outcomes. Um, I, I think that's the only ethically def defensible way to approach uh, these, these triage situations. And I'm happy to say that my views ended up prevailing, at, <laughs> at least with, with, our, with our guidelines. So um, a couple of us are, are looking at publishing a piece sort of contrasting some of the differences between the UPIT model and the University of California model. And that's one of the key issues that we're, um, that we're trying to provide sort of an alternative uh, model and alternative arguments in favor of. I don't know if you all, I'm sure you saw, but when, um, when COVID was, uh, you know, sort of new on the scene in April, Dr. Emanuel's piece in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that was titled Fair Allocation of Scarce Resources in the Time of COVID-19. And he, you know, he, he laid out the ethical values that just seemed like we all should ascribe to when we're thinking about these decisions. And at first glance, they, they sound fine, right? He says, maximizing benefits, treating equally, yeah. giving priority to the worst off. But then you look at the fine print and when he talks about giving priority to the worst off, he says, this could be seen as giving priority to the sickest or to the younger people who will have lived the shortest lives. I, I've been a doctor almost 20 years, and I just, when, you, when I think of the people who are the worst off, 
Oftentimes the, the youngest patients um, don't come to mind. It just is a very interesting wordsmithing there too. Also, when you looked at his definition of maximizing benefits, he said seeing as you know, saving the most lives or saving the most life, 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 uh, life years, which again, is in, it's incredibly ageist because you're, you have blatant discrimination there against older Americans. And as an internal medicine physician who takes care of mostly older adults, I just found that to be to be quite quite shocking, actually. And we brought this paper up with my students, actually, when we, we had an ethics class for the students. And at first, they they, they thought Manuel's paper was fine. Then they got into the details, and, and actually, their sense of justice was pricked. And then they, they were actually outraged at the end of it. Yeah. So, so we have just a, a little bit more before we want to invite questions. But what I'd like to do is, building on that comment, Kristen and others, I'd like to return to this, this question. We've been talking more about this strange interface between individual care and these sort of public health perspectives. And I, I as a fellow physician, feel torn in that, of course, um, because I, I know that my concern is for the individual patient. It, Chesterton trenchantly pointed out that there are some people who love humanity but don't particularly care for humans individually. And that's a that's a chilling thought. In the, in the process of professional um, uh, mandates, prerogatives as physicians, we we feel this dedication to the individual patient. And I think many of you may have seen those in the panel and those in the listening audience may have seen a picture, a very moving picture, a few it was a week or two ago, of a physician embracing an elderly man who was clearly dying of COVID. It was such a moving picture because you knew that that physician was taking on an added dimension of risk. And at the same time, you felt very powerfully that there was something going on there that was more powerful and more important than, than the kind of caution that may have been breached. It, it was as though love was more ultimate and that, that made me think of the, the historical precedent of the, the, the order founded by Camilla Stellelis, who was a soldier who, after a tumultuous life of, of gambling and, and terrible behavior, uh, Franciscans took him in when he was just about done in and rehabilitated him spiritually. And he went on to found the Camillans, which were ultimately the model for the, the uh, Red Cross. But the, the famous story at the beginning of the Camillans um, service was that they went out onto the ships that had the plague and tended the, the sick and the dying. And that is a, always has struck me as a very, very interesting comment on the role of love and particularly the role of love as, as physicians, how we, we serve um, to, lay to, to, to offer ourselves in a way that goes beyond what even we would expect of others. Um, Jesus, of course, said that, that no greater love hath any man than to lay down his life for his friends. And that this is just brings me to something in a broader way I wanted to introduce to the panel to, to make comment on, then we'll go to individual comments. What about this whole general thing that we've been going through during the last 10 months, nine months, relating to the question of death and, and how we feel about the risks we take. For a Christian, the admonitions to visit the sick, that's based on a large perspective on the meaning of our lives and the meaning of eternal life within that context. Could you make comment on this and how this relates to the pandemic? Yeah, I, I would be happy to comment on that, Bill. Um, for us as Christians, uh, well, first of all, for physicians, I think if we see death as the last enemy of medicine to be conquered, we're going to lose every time. So that can't be the model for medicine because in spite of all of our wonderful medical advances, the human mortality rate continues to hold steady at 100%, right? So all of our patients eventually and all of us eventually we know are, are going to die. Um, Death is the outcome that gets the most attention when we're talking about healthcare policy. Um, but as a society, we, we know that there are many competing goods. And the idea that we could, uh, if we only try harder, we can bring the COVID 
case curve or the COVID mortality curve down to zero is really quite insane. And our, our recognition that there are other competing social goods uh, that uh, some decisions will have unintended but very foreseeable and real consequences on our mental health, what I call the other pandemic of uh, the, the current mental health crisis, um, is, is not uh, is not being cavalier about death. It's not uh, avoiding the, the, the tragedy of death for every one of those patients who has died of COVID. Um, but it's recognize it's recognizing that um, as human beings we're we're finite we're frail and we're not in complete control of of everything and I think that's one of the sober realities that most people don't want to acknowledge that that we need to face about this pandemic is that we we can't control it we can do some things to mitigate some of the worst effects of it but we certainly are not in control of what's happening with COVID. That's a complete delusion. Uh, one analogy I use to, to try to help people um, get away from a narrow tunnel vision when they're thinking about uh, what we ought to be doing as a society now in the face of COVID is, is to point out that uh, we know a certain number of people are gonna die in motor vehicle accidents every year, let's say, in in the state of California, just to use my state as the example, and that um, we could save every single one of those lives if we really wanted to, as a, as a state or as a society. All we would have to do is lower the speed limit to 10 miles an hour everywhere, including on the interstate, on the, on the freeways and highways and so forth. Um, and, and we know with, with a very good degree of certainty that that would save whatever it is, tens of thousands of lives every year of people who otherwise would have died. By refusing to do that, are, are, we, are, are we embracing death as some sort of good for all of those people? No, we're recognizing that life is complex and there are many competing goods at stake here. And you know, we don't force kids to play soccer with helmets on. And we, we take calculated risks all the time uh, in order to achieve other goods that human beings want to pursue. Um, and so what I see at work now is kind of the inability to see that kind of complexity and nuance in relation to the pandemic. And it's, it's blinding us and clouding our vision and leading us in many cases towards policies that are ill-devised and um, in many cases probably doing more harm than good. And I think a lot of it has to do with our basic stance toward an attitude toward death. And as, as Christians, we, we should be the ones ha that have um, a more realistic appraisal and understanding of, uh, of the reality of death and the, the place of death in a life well lived. I just wanna just sort of um, jump on that and we're coming short on time, but um, so many of you know that I actually contracted COVID-19 in the course of patient care. Um, so I'm fully aware of, of, of this in, in a very real sense. I know, I know someone else in this panel also got COVID in patient care. Um, and there, there is risk, obviously, medicine. There's risk in so many things that we do, as Aaron talked about. There's risk in childbirth. There's risk in driving a car. We take risks all the time. We send our defense to defend our country or firefighters into a fire, right? Um, and I think, you know, before I, before I got COVID and I knew that we were going to be taking care of COVID patients at my clinical site, of course, I was, I was nervous. I was nervous about contracting COVID and passing it to my four boys or to my husband. Um, but I think, you know, as, as you've said, I think as, as Christians, we have, we have this proper view of, of, of life um, and death. And I think for, for sometimes for others that don't have any um, sort of view of, of the transcendent, um, that view might be different, um, but I, I just, as a Christian, I, 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 I'm just reminded of Job, you know, I can't, I'm not gonna, who am I to like take the good um, and not the bad, especially when it comes to all the privilege that my profession has given me and the choices and opportunities. So I think, you know, there's, I think in us, for us to fully embrace life, I do feel like part of that is embracing risk. And I think, you know, even thinking about our culture sort of becoming more emotionally comfortable with risk and to actually think about us practice, practicing some risky hospitality in the days and weeks to come. Because as you said, Aaron, I agree, failing to save as many lives as possible is, is not to get them out to homicide. Uh, because as Christians, we understand that there are other goods, right? 
that we value that may justify increasing our risk of COVID-19, whether it be getting last rites from a religious figure or being able to visit with someone at the, at the end of life. We, we know there are values that and these kinds of goods, right, that could justify the possibility of a marginally higher infection rate. Um, and a so-far calculation, which thinks about nothing but lowering the infection rate, really undermines and maybe ignores these aspects of human flourishing and really what, what it means to be a human being. So we have we have some good questions. Some of them have have partly been been covered already, but there's one broad theme that seems to be running through the questions, and and that relates to this this sense in which medicine itself is a subset of a larger pro life perspective, one that that endows dignity, the individual, sustains social solidarity, and and allows a physician a very special role in witnessing to the to the broader sense of the meaning of human life. I I, I think it'd be very good if we if we return to that insight that that the very word hospital comes from a, a broader notion of caring for one another, hospitality. Um, its historical roots were places that welcomed the stranger and especially in a non-judgmental way. One of the things I as a physician hold especially close to my concerns is that we never judge a person for why they're sick, but we care for them the best we can. I'd be interested to hear your comments on that in the broad way. Why don't we start with Laris on that one? You know, I, as, as I was thinking about the last set of comments, I, to try to tie some things together, I remember last year reading a report about how many Catholic priests in Northern Italy had died during the pandemic uh, at its worst there. And when thinking about what you had said, Bill, about, about the power of love, being the power of love in a, in a profoundly Christian Trinitarian sense as being that which can overwhelm the darkness of the fear of death, right? And that then also connects to what Aaron was talking about regarding the, the, the nature of suffering and how suffering is truly part of the human condition and how it is the case, as some people have very astutely written, that if there were no suffering in human life, there would be no occasion for human love, for any love actually, for human beings, because suffering is fundamentally a sign, an indication of our incapacity, our neediness as, as human beings. Sickness, illness, in the context of healthcare is, is this profound landscape in which this is brought to our attention again and again as human beings, despite our great fear of it. And yet from our perspective as health professionals and specifically as Christian healthcare professionals, we see why healthcare is such a great place to be, great place in the sense that we have this remarkable privilege and opportunity to be used by God to, to be a, a true blessing to those who are in this moment of crisis and need. And may, by God's grace, we be sustained, especially at the difficult time we're in right now, where so many healthcare professionals are really at wit's end, to put it gently. And so uh, through, through prayer and whatever resources we have to help each other out, there is this profound need uh, to, to encourage each other onward. Uh, Bill, I think you're muted. Uh, you know, what's happening is my leaf, my gardener is doing the leaf blowing outside my window, the hazards of Zoom. Huh? So, uh, Kristen, do you have any thoughts on this? No, th I think I think Loris's uh, answer was quite sufficient. Uh -huh. Thanks, Loris. So, uh, unfortunately, we're heading toward the last few minutes of this, and and I would like to give each of you a chance to make some sort of concluding statements. That was a quite a beautiful statement on your your part, Laris. Aaron, do you have any further thoughts? Yeah, I I want to echo what Laris just said and encourage any young people in the audience to consider healthcare. Um, I have uh, I have a job that uh, is an enormous privilege. It's an enormous privilege to to do what I do. And there are enormous challenges in medicine and it's very expensive to become a physician and it takes a long time. And there are problems in healthcare right now that are tough to deal with. But uh, for all that, I'm enormously grateful for 
this vocation to be a physician. And if you are called to it, um, if you pray and discern and decide that this is what God wants you to devote your life to, um, you're very fortunate. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to pursue it. Um, I, I just want to mention one other anecdote in closing is it's another one of my, and perhaps I've been too pessimistic during this panel, but I guess this would be another cautionary tale to encourage us um, to, to, to see, I think there's a danger in a, a kind of um, encroachment of public health into domains of life where um, everything becomes medicalized and other human goods can become eclipsed. And, and this came up, this is a case of uh, an ethics consult. We're getting a lot more end of life ethics consults right now because families can't visit their loved ones. And if a loved one is, is dying, we allow them to visit, but sort of up until the point where we, where we recognize there's nothing more we can do for this person, the family's not necessarily there at the bedside watching what's happening and seeing their loved one decline. So we were meeting with a family who, uh, whose loved one was dying of COVID. It was clear that he was not going to survive this hospitalization. We were trying to help the family uh, to accept that. And they just as they sort of turned the corner and be, uh, began the process of accepting that and thinking through, can you get us help with funeral arrangements? They were informed by the case manager that because of a public health directive, uh, they were not going to be able to uh, see the see the deceased body and uh, the body would be cremated um, and they were not going to be able to, to have a traditional burial. Um, and the, the public health rationale for this is we don't know whether a cadaver uh, is capable of sort of infecting someone with COVID. Uh, and so we're just going to be on the safe side and require cremation of anyone who dies of the coronavirus. Uh, the family was devastated when they learned this, uh, that they could not bury their loved one. And, um, you know, as we know, as Christians, uh, at least in the Catholic tradition, uh, cremation is accepted, but not necessarily preferred. It's, um, th there's something about burial that is a helpful sign of the resurrection of the body, which we profess in the creed. And I think this was a a family that um, they were they were Catholic and understood that maybe intuitively uh, more than intellectually, and to to inflict that additional harm on them struck me as taking away a known good, which is sort of the, the natural right to bury the dead, right? What Antigone was fighting to do for her brother over against the the king's order uh, and and decree. Uh, taking that known good and sacrificing it on the altar of a theoretical harm, one that we had no empirical evidence for, uh, one that might exist, uh, one that could potentially contribute to a problem. And when we get to the point where the models or the, the, uh, the theoretical harms become more real to us than the actual patient or family sitting here in front of us uh, or to a real human good, like the ability to bury the dead that um, that we can no longer recognize as even a good, um, I, I think something has gone wrong. And um, so I, I think that a crisis can clarify certain things in our mind, help us see what's most important, help us prioritize our values. Uh, but especially when we're in it for this sort of chronic length of time, it can also begin to distort our thinking in certain ways. And so I think there's going to be important work to be done uh, to recover some of the things that have been lost or, or sacrificed on the altar of um, a narrow understanding, a utilitarian understanding of public health. Kristen, do you have any final comments? Yeah, I just want to maybe um, take it back on what Aaron said about these different competing goods and how we view them in our commitments. Um, so, you know, no, I too, I, I encounter many people who believe that traditional Christian commitment means doing everything possible to preserve life. But, you know, our best theologians and philosophers have been thinking for centuries about the kinds of goods, ultimate beneficial values, things like you mentioned, Aaron, with the ability to bury the body and to visit loved ones at death. 
that are at least as important as preserving life. And in reality, you know, preserving life at any cost is the kind of idolatry that rejects not only the example of many Christian martyrs, but of the example of Jesus Christ himself. So obviously, you know, the kind of human being and human flourishing revealed by God through Jesus Christ is nothing to do with utilitarian calculation. And I've been I'm somewhat vocal about my uh, calling myself a, ref a reformed utilitarian. Um, and I speak out a lot about, especially over this past year with COVID. Um, and I just want to say as, 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 as healthcare providers and physicians um, in particular and, and nurses, you know, we are called to imitate and find his face in the least ones on the margins of the culture, period regardless of what the math, which is impossible to do in ethics anyway, tells us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Loris. I, I think this has been wonderful. Bill, thank you for, for your moderating influence on us all. And it's been a tremendous privilege to be with you all today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, first, I want to thank the panel. A wonderful, well-grounded perspectives coming from your experience and also your deep spiritual devotion. Um, I, I, want to, um, I, I want to make one little comment before we end here. We've spoken boldly and clearly about, about the role of love here. I just want to add a little note here that, that adds the notion that love is, deals with very serious realities. We should never, none of us should be cavalier about the risks associated with this pandemic. It's very serious and potentially serious for any age group. I think we should all take, um, take uh, the, the meaning of care to extend very well into the meaning of caution. So yes, there are serious moments for taking more risks. They may be sacramental, they may be related to burial, they may be very related to the expression of love in varied ways. But let's also all be very careful and not, not transmit this virus. We, we are on the edge of hope, hopeful possibilities here for controlling it and containing it. So that's, that's um, but, but placed within that, love is clearly the overarching theme, which transforms us from being sociologists and utilitarian calculators to being real human beings in the image of our Lord. So, with, with that as the conclusion, again, thank you to the panel. And I would like to remind the listening audience that, that uh, there are further sessions to come up. And the next one is Archbishop Jose Gomez from Los Angeles will speak at 8 p.m. Eastern time on the theme of what we owe the migrant, a very interesting and important issue. Um, especially related to ours, since there's a higher incidence of, of, of um, COVID serious repercussions in some migrant populations. Um, you can log in on the same Zoom link for all the sessions, and you can obtain more information about the, the Nicola Center, um, ethicscenter.notredame.edu. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us and wish you good health good joy, even in the midst of these difficult times, and remember that we belong to one another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you.